up to now, the topics I've done in this course have been largely chosen, partly because they've just got beautiful proofs, but um, also in order to illustrate the uses of various non-obvious techniques in combinatorics. Today I want to um, talk about a topic um, where the proof that I'm going to present is just a good old-fashioned direct first principles elementary argument. Elementary not in the sense of easy to find but just pretty easy to understand, short and not requiring any sort of background in clever combinatorial techniques. It's just a direct argument that could in principle be explained to somebody who just just arrived at Cambridge as an undergraduate, let's say. Um, the topic in question, or the sort of broad topic, is something called permutation patterns. And to give an idea of what that means, I'm going to make a definition um, of when we say that one permutation is contained in another. Uh, oh, I think my writing thing is not plugged in, but let's quickly do that. And why not? There we go. Um, so, what does that mean? So, let's suppose we have um, a permutation that belongs to SK, the symmetric group of K elements, uh, and we have another permutation, sigma, in Sn, and n is greater than or equal to k, and usually we think of n as being quite a lot bigger than k. Maybe k is fixed and n tending to infinity or something like that. And we'll say that sigma contains pi, or pi is contained in sigma, um, if we can find x1 less than xk belonging to n, which is a set that sigma is permuting, such that uh, sigma xi is less than sigma xj if and only if pi i is less than pi of j. So what that's telling us, if we take the elements x1 up to xk, sigma doesn't have to um, permute those elements, because it could send them to completely different elements, but it does have to reorder them in some way. And if the reordering of x1 up to xk is exactly the way that pi reorders the elements from 1 to k, that's when we say sigma contains pi. Maybe to illustrate that with an example, let's take uh, pi to be the permutation 2, 4, 1, 3. Uh, that's not cycle notation there. That means uh, in this thing I want 1 to map to 2, 2 to map to 4, 4 to map to 1, uh, sorry, 3 to map to 1 I mean, and 4 to map to 3. And now let's just take, a, I'll take a permutation of nine elements. So I'll go for sort of two, eight, three, one, seven, nine, five, four, six, let's say. Uh, I think that will probably contain two, four, one, three. Yes, it does, because for example, I can take two, eight, one, seven. So if you look at the ordering, that goes third one, first one, fourth one, second one, just as here, the third one is the first one, fourth one, third, uh, third one, first one, fourth one, second one. So the ordering two, four, one, three, it kind of looks like that. And similarly, the ordering two, eight, one, seven is similar. Uh, right, let's get rid of those two diagrams. I think you've got the idea. Uh, might as well just point out that uh, 2413 is probably contained in, in other ways. So, for example, I could take, um, or is it? Maybe it isn't. Uh, actually, I can't find immediately another thing. I think that 2817 may be the only way that 24, or oh, wait a minute, 2. Yep, I would have to do um, the one as the third. Yeah, I think that's the, the only one actually, but that's not important. Um, so there is a, a big sort of industry of getting formulae for how many permutations of SN, in SN as N grows uh, don't contain various fixed permutations. <clears throat> so for 2413, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's known. 
Um, but there's also a more general question one can ask, which is if we're given a permutation, just some fixed permutation, how can this number, if we define Fn to be um, the, uh, the number of permutations in Sn that, that do not contain some fixed permutation pi, or F pi of n if you like, how can uh, F pi grow? And um, if you sort of do a bit of experiment, you find that you can't find, it, it always seems to grow at most exponentially. So um, just to give an idea that that's a rather strong restriction, remember the number of permutations in Sn is n factorial, which as I've discussed in a previous video is sort of basically n over e to the n, or sort of constant to the n log n. And uh, so saying that we've got exponential growth is saying we've got some other constant, d or something to the n, at most d to the n. So that grows a lot more slowly than c to the n log n. Exponential growth is quite a bit smaller than factorial growth. But uh, it wasn't very easy to prove that that was the case. And so that became a pretty well-known problem called the uh, Stanley Wilf conjecture. That's Richard Stanley and Herb Wilf, two very well-known combinatorialists, more on the sort of algebraic side of the subject. Um, right, now before I, so by the end of this video, we will have seen a solution to the Stanley Wilf conjecture. But before we get onto that, I want to discuss another conjecture and before I do that, I need to give another definition. So let's say that A is a K by K not one matrix. So not one matrix means just its entries are noughts and ones. And B is an N by N not one matrix. And again, N is gonna be bigger than K or at least as big as K. We'll say that B contains A if, and there are two good ways of describing this. So one is if there exists x1 up to xk, uh, sorry, the very important detail that I need to put when I say this, that these are an increasing sequence. I'll discuss this condition a bit more in a moment. And y1 up to yk, such that um, if aij equals one, then b xi yj equals one. So if I draw a little picture, let's have a matrix A will go for one, naught, 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 one, one, naught, naught, one. Just as an example, if A is that, then we've got some matrix B that contains zeros and ones. I've got to be able to find X1, X2, these are the rows, X3, I'll label them. And uh, Y1, Y2, and Y3. such that in each place where there's a one, in the corresponding place in B, there's a one. So uh, I'll, I, it's not very nice to draw a one, so I'll just put little blobs where there have to be ones here. They were required to have ones in those four places. Note I'm not saying that we're required to have zeros in those places. So it's a sort of containment where um, it's a bit like when a graph is a subgraph of another graph. That's saying that the, f the, the second graph has to have an edge wherever the first one has an edge, but we don't require the second one to have a non-edge where the first one has a non-edge, unless we're saying that the graph is an induced subgraph. So this is more like a subgraph rather than an induced subgraph. And actually, it's not just an analogy. This really is, if you look at it the right way, saying that we've got a, a subgraph because um, we can think of A as the adjacency matrix of a bipartite graph. So the vertex sets are the rows and the columns and we join a row to a column if there's a one in the corresponding place. So what we're saying here is that we can find, a, we've got a bigger graph here, we can find a subgraph of it, i.e. three vertices on one side, three vertices on the other side, 
such that uh, every time you've got an edge here, you've got an edge here, but we don't insist that when there's a non-edge, there's a non-edge. But it's very, very important that this is not just any old uh, graph. It can't be doing any old way. We require that the embedding that takes vertices to vertices is order preserving. So the first row, second row, third row must go to a row, then a later row, then a later row, and similarly with the columns. So actually our structure here is not graphs and subgraphs, it's graphs with total orderings on their vertices and subgraphs. So that's a, a nice way of thinking about it uh, in graph theoretic terms. There's also another way of thinking about this concept. And for that, I'll make another definition. So supposing I've got a matrix, uh, I'll call it B just because we're going to be applying this to the B over here, uh, a zero one matrix. And supposing I partition the rows and columns in some way. But again, because we're talking about, uh, we, we care about orderings here. So I'm not, it's not just any old partition of rows and columns, it's got to be a partition into intervals. So the first few rows and the next few rows and the next few rows and the next few rows and similarly with columns. I'll say that um, I get a quotient matrix. <clears throat> and what I mean by the quotient matrix, it's going to be a four by four matrix because I've got uh, four cells and partition here and four, so at least with this way I've drawn this. And every time I've got a one in one of these, uh, blocks, doesn't matter where it is. So I'll call, it, I'll call one of the uh, things like this a block. So every time I've got a one in a block, I must have a one. I, I then take a one, sorry, in, in the corresponding place. And so these ones, I'll perhaps I'll just draw this one somewhere else to emphasize, they don't all have to line up. Um, but here obviously they do line up. And then all the other blocks where I haven't drawn ones, perhaps again to make it look more sort of general, I've got sort of a couple of ones there. And all these other blocks I'm going to assume are completely empty of ones. And so there in the quotient matrix, I'll draw them as zeros. Uh, I've got a whole row of zeros there. So this is a quotient matrix of this, assuming that everything that I haven't drawn is zero. Um, now, let's suppose we've got, uh, suppose we go back to this matrix, which contains this matrix, then we will see straight away that, uh, maybe let's take a different color for a second. If I just split up, I choose a partition by splitting up x1, x2 and x3 and then a partition of the columns that splits up y1, y2 and y3 and I look at this quotient matrix, then I just see that x1, y1 gives me a one in this block here, uh, x2, y2 give me a block in this, uh, a one in this block here, x2 and y3 give me a one in this block here, and we see that the quotient matrix contains A, or is a, a sort of super matrix of A. And more generally, uh, if I take any quotient matrix that um, splits up x1, x2, and x3, and y1, y2, and y3, I'll get, a, I'll get a quotient matrix that still contains A. And the converse is not quite true, but it is true if we ask for A to be a permutation matrix. So if A is a permutation matrix, that means, or what that means is that um, there's exactly one one in each row and column. And suppose, let me, um, Let me draw this on a fresh sheet. So supposing I've got a quotient matrix, I'll stick with this uh, example here. So supposing I've got a matrix B that has a quotient that uh, sort of dominates this, that's got a one everywhere where that matrix has a one. So we, it means we've got a one in there somewhere, we've got a one there somewhere, we've got a one in that block, we've got a one in that block, we might have some ones in other blocks, doesn't really matter. I claim that uh, this matrix must contain A. And that's because I can just pick the rows that correspond, oh, sorry, this is supposed to be a permutation matrix now, I've messed up. So let's make it a permutation matrix. 
and slightly alter what I drew over here. So I need to have a one in this block and I need to have a one in this block. Uh, so now if I just want to find a, or if I want to prove that B contains A, I just choose the rows that correspond to the ones in the various blocks and I choose the columns that correspond to those ones and then that's X1, X2, X3, Y1, Y2 and Y3. So what I've, been, what I've just proved there is that there are two equivalent definitions. One definition of uh, a matrix containing another matrix is the definition I first gave where you have X1, X2, X3 and so on, this, this uh, one there. And the other one is there is a quotient that uh, is one whenever A is one and doesn't have to be zero when A is zero. And that just turned out to be a useful alternative way of looking at things as we'll see. Right, now what is the question about these matrices? The question is, if A is a permutation matrix, how many ones can B have? And to make this question more precise, here's a conjecture. which is now not a conjecture anymore. I'll be proving it in a moment. Due to Furedi and Hainal, uh, that uh, at most linear. So <clears throat> to put that slightly more formally, for all pi, there exists a C pi such that if B doesn't contain uh, sorry, C, uh, for all pi, and if P, B doesn't contain the matrix of pi, so the permutation matrix corresponding to pi, uh, then <clears throat> B has at most C pi n ones, where B is an n by n matrix. And Firedi and Heinal proved that, uh, that the Firedi Heinal conjecture implies the Stanley Wolf Stanley Wolf conjecture. <clears throat> so if you can do this one, you can do the other one. And we can do this one thanks to Marcus and Tardosh. So they proved FH. And we can have a look at their proof. And it's a really gorgeous argument. Um, and another of these arguments that dazzled people with its uh, simplicity, really. But it's, as I, as I like to say repeatedly with this kind of thing, it is a simple argument, but it's not a simple argument to find. And actually, I feel this personally because I was working with. Um, a former research student of mine on a problem where we sort of it's actually it turns out to be a, uh, a result that has a number of applications and so it just arises naturally in a number of contexts and this student and I um, it arose in the context that we were working in and we started thinking about it before we were completely aware that it was a known result and so we thought pretty hard about it and couldn't solve it um, and eventually I sort of it, it rang a slight bell. I did the right sort of Googling and I found it. And uh, there it was, this incredible argument that although simple is somehow not the thing that will jump it straight into your head. So let me show you and then see what you think. Um, so what we'll do is the following. We'll say, so we'll fix, actually it's not very fixed as you'll see, but we'll fix a permutation matrix And we'll let uh, Fn be the largest number, so F also depends on A, but I'll suppress that, the largest number of ones in any n by n 
zero one matrix that does not contain a and we're going to prove some facts about fn um, now let's suppose for now that uh, <coughs> n is oh, so a and uh, I'll just specify that it's a K by K permutation matrix. So suppose for now that N is a multiple of K squared. And so let B be an N by N matrix that doesn't contain A. I could perhaps have said that earlier, but uh, here we go. Uh, and now divide B up into K squared by K squared blocks. Um, so just to be clear what I mean by that, I mean the blocks themselves are k squared by k squared matrices. So the number of blocks is, uh, well, there are, I've partitioned this into n over k squared set, sets here and n over k squared sets here. So I better just make that really clear. I, each block is a k squared by k squared submatrix. Uh, in a way, the next definition or pair of definitions that I'm about to give, a pair of linked definitions, is the key idea of the proof. It's really, uh, it, well, it's not obvious why that should be in advance, but it, when you look back on it, you'll see that it was. So, define a block wide if um, I'm going to introduce a little bit of extra terminology, sort of slightly informal, if at least k of its columns are occupied. And what do I mean by occupied, i.e. contain at least a one, uh, contain a one. We'll define a block tall, and no prizes for guessing what I'm about to say, if at least k of its rows are occupied. Now let's prove a really fairly straightforward lemma. Lemma one. Um, in any column of blocks, so I'll just explain quickly what I mean by that. It should be fairly clear, I think. I just mean something like this. So in any column of blocks, there are at most k minus one times k squared choose k wide blocks. And let's see why that's the case. Actually, the bound that I've just written there gives it rather a big clue about how to prove it. So, Where's this k squared choose k? That's the number of ways of choosing k objects from a set of size k squared. 
well, we've got k squared rows, we've got k squared columns. So we're either going to be looking at ways of choosing k columns or we're looking at ways of choosing k rows, given the definition of why column seems likely. Well, let's just see that. Um, so suppose some block of columns contains more than k minus one, k squared choose k wide blocks. So from each wide block, or for each wide block, let's say, choose a set of k occupied columns. Well, there are only k squared choose k ways we could have done that. We've got more than k minus one times that wide blocks. So by the pigeonhole principle, some choice is made at least k times. And we're nearly there actually, so let's just, uh, I'll draw the setup when we've got say k equals three, so we've got a sort of block there, we've got another block there, we've got another block down there somewhere, and we've chosen the same three columns from each block. And each of those columns are occupied. So I'll draw, again, I'll draw some blobs for some ones. So there's a one there, 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 and a one there, let's say. And now I think you can see that, uh, so this is three equals K here, but so this, this is completely general. Um, you can see that any three by three permutation matrix on this diagram, it's easy to find. So supposing I've got the permutation matrix one, like that. If I want to find that, well, I'll just pick that blob there, uh, and I'll pick that blob there, and I'll pick that blob there. To put it another way, if I take a quotient by splitting up like that, and then splitting these three columns apart, then that quotient will actually be the matrix that's got all ones in it. And again, I'm not, there's nothing special about three here. I could have, what I've said would have applied if I'd had K blobs with the, the same K columns oper, um, occupied in each case. And of course I've got all ones and then certainly I contain all um, permutation matrices of that size. So that proves lemma one. Uh, and needless to say, by exactly the same argument or by just flipping things and applying symmetry or something like that, we also get that uh, the number of all blocks in any row of blocks is at most k minus one k squared choose k. Pressing on. So I'll just remind you uh, of the definition of f of n. f of n was the largest number of, um, I've lost it, oh, here we are. it's up at the top of the page here, the largest number of ones in any n by n zero one matrix that doesn't contain a so now we're going to get a bound for f of n, but not exactly as one would expect. So uh, remember, we were assuming that k squared divides n. So all this is still under the assumption that k squared divides n. Uh, perhaps I'll write that. So if k squared divides n, then f of n is less than or equal to. And I wonder whether I shall state it and then prove it, or I'll just um, state it. I'm going to prove it as I go along. 
Um, I think I will just write it and then justify it afterwards. So we get at most two k squared k minus one k squared choose k n plus f n over k squared times k minus one squared. Right, let me justify that. So the number of ones in in wide blocks it's got enough bound for that okay it's going to be at most the number of columns uh, of blocks and the number of columns of blocks is n over k squared we have to multiply that by the number of wide blocks that you can have in a column, which we've just shown is at most k minus one times k squared choose k. And we've got to multiply that by the number of ones that you can have in a wide block, which is trivially at most k to the four. And so we get uh, k squared k minus one k squared choose k times n is half of this and of course the other half comes from the tall blocks. Uh, so same for tall and so that's given us this term here. What about the other term? So now we want the number of ones in blocks that are neither, that are neither wide nor tall. Right, let's think about this. Um, I'm going to draw a matrix. We've split it up into, into blocks. Um, I'm going to throw away everything that belongs to a wide or tall block and just think about the rest. So I've got a few blocks that are occupied. Now, how many of these blocks can be occupied? Well, um, every time there's a block that's occupied, that's going to give me um, a one in the corresponding quotient matrix. And if that corresponding quotient matrix contains a copy of A, then the whole matrix will contain a copy of A. I just do the usual thing. I um, pick the relevant rows and columns, and that gives me the containment. So that immediately tells me that the number of occupied blocks is at most f of n over k squared, because this is an n over k squared by n over k squared matrix. Uh, and if I take the quotient, then it's not allowed to contain a. So we get that. And then we've got to multiply by the number of elements that you can have in a block that is neither wide nor tall. But then at most k minus one columns are occupied and at most k minus one rows are occupied. So the number of elements we can have is at most k minus one squared. And that's where this other term comes from. And that's basically game over. Um, but as with all these things, you, you have to uh, do a slightly tedious argument at the end to solve the recurrence. So let's just uh, quickly write again what we've proved. We've proved that if k squared divides n, then fn is less than or equal to 2 k squared k minus 1 k squared choose k plus uh, oh, I've got to put the n here actually I thought I could do that plus k minus 1 squared f n over k squared um, so theorem actually fn is less than or equal to uh, 2k to the fourth k squared choose k n for all 
n and we'll prove it by induction. And the base case is actually rather a big base case. We'll say if n is less than or equal to k squared, what am I going to say? I'm going to say uh, fn is less than or equal to k to the fourth. And that's certainly less than or equal to 2k to the fourth k squared to k times n. So we're certainly down all the way up to k squared. Now let uh, m be the largest inter uh, integer, well, sorry, largest multiple of k squared. Less than or equal to n. And we'll make a following little observation. We get that, uh, so we, we, we know how to deal with f of m. We want to get something with f of n and we'll just make the following observation. If we, if we take an n by n matrix that doesn't contain a, and if I look at its first m rows and columns, that matrix there doesn't contain a. Um, I'm going to say something slightly trivial. And then I just say the worst that can happen now is we've got ones absolutely everywhere else. And how many other entries are there? Well, m was the largest multiple of k squared less than or equal to n. So there are at most k squared columns here, at most k squared rows here. Uh, even if we forget the fact that those things overlap, we get that sort of plus uh, two k squared n. So I will um, think about what fm is at most. Uh, actually, we'll just carry on like this. So that's less than or equal to by what we proved, 2k squared k minus 1, k squared choose k times m. Um, and I'm going to say that m is at most n. So and plus. I think I'm going to run out of space if I do much further, so I'll, I'll put it here, plus k minus 1 squared. And then what can we say about f of n over k squared? Oh, sorry, f of m over k squared. That's by induction um, at most 2k to the fourth k squared choose k times m over k squared, which again is at most n over k squared, and then we add 2k squared n on at the end, and then we've got that inequality. And this we can simplify a little bit further. So let's take out some factors that we can take out. So we can take out a, a 2 and a k squared. And by the way, this k to the fourth and k squared are going to cancel, but I'll, so let's just do it 2k squared. I'm going to do something that I'm not strictly speaking allowed to do, but I am because this is an inequality. So I'm going to take out a factor k squared choose k, which wasn't in here, but I'll pretend it is in here because if I stick it in here, I just make it bigger. So that's okay. And we have an n. Um, that'll do. And what's left over? Uh, I have a k minus one left over here. And I have um, a k minus one squared. Something looks not quite right here. Um, I'll just keep going. Perhaps this is all right. Actually, I think this is fine. Sorry, plus um, this. I took out the 2k squared, so I'm going to put a plus 1 here. And yes, that is fine. So k minus 1 squared plus k minus 1 plus 1 is at most k minus 1 squared plus 2k minus 1 plus 1, which is at most k squared. So that's less than or equal to 2k to the fourth k squared choose k times n. Needless to say, the, the details of that uh, last argument are extremely unimportant. All that matters is once you've got a recurrence like this, it gives you some kind of bound. If it wasn't that bound, it would be another one. Um, right, so that's finished the proof of the Marcus-Tardosh theorem.
but uh, or let's say it's the, the proof of the I don't know what is normally called the Markov Tardosh theorem, whether it's the solution to the Faraday Heinel conjecture or the solution to the Stanley Wills conjecture or both. But let's now deduce the Stanley Wills conjecture. So um, FH implies SW. So perhaps to avoid confusion, I'm now going to say we'll define. So we'll, we'll let uh, A be a permutation matrix. And let uh, GN be the number of N by N matrices that uh, do not contain A. I realize there's something I haven't actually said, which is that, um, so I'm counting the number of n by n, zero, one matrices, of course, but uh, if I look at the number of, uh, if, if I've got a permutation matrix that contains another permutation matrix, that is equivalent to saying that this permutation contains this permutation. Um, so that's pretty straightforward from the definition. So I'm not going to detain myself by proving it. So if I get a bound for the number of n, min, n by n zero one matrices that fail to contain A, that is going to give me the same bound for the number of permutations that uh, do not contain the given permutation that corresponds to A. So I just have to prove that this is exponential. I have got an up, upper bound that's exponential. So um, what we're going to do is the following. Um, Suppose that n is even. And divide um, let's just say let's divide every n by n matrix into two by two blocks for the purposes of counting them. Right, so let's think about uh, how many ways there are so we're going, to, we're going to get a bound for G of 2n. Uh, sorry, we'll get a bound for Gn in terms of n, Gn over 2. So we'll look at which blocks we're allowed, or so how many ways there are of deciding which blocks we're going to put a 1 into. And then we'll look at how many, how many ways there are of putting those 1s. So how many ways are there of deciding how to put, how to occupy some blocks? Well, each time we occupy some blocks, uh, if we then look at a, the corresponding n over 2 by n over 2 quotient matrix, we'll get a matrix that still has to avoid A. So the number of ways that we can put ones into, the number of ways we can choose which blocks to occupy is going to be at most Gn over 2. That's because, as I say, every time we, so I'm putting a cross every time there's a one inside the block. And if I do that, then I get a quotient matrix. And if that quotient matrix contains A, then so does the whole matrix. Uh, so it's not allowed to contain A. So the number of ways I can decide which blocks to occupy is at most Gn over two. And once I've decided how to occupy those blocks, how many, uh, or which blocks to occupy, how many ways are there of deciding uh, how to occupy them? Uh, the answer is um, it's the number of blocks that we can, the largest possible number of blocks that we can fill. Um, now the largest number of blocks that we can fill is at most some constant that depends on A times N. So um, 
let's just say this a different way. Each block is a two by two matrix. How many ways are there of filling it such that there's at least one one? Well, there are four entries to choose between, so there are 16 ways of assigning zeros and ones, but only 15 if you insist that there's at least one one. So each block can be filled in 15 ways. And how many blocks are there at most? There's this constant that depends on A times N. And that's where I've used the, uh, for the solution to the fouradi hynal conjecture. So I've done two things. So the number of ways of putting these blocks is at most gn over two, that's just an inductive hypothesis, but the number of blocks that there actually are in each way that we do it is at most cn. There are at most 15 ways that we can fill a block so that there's at least one one. So the number of ways that we can uh, produce this matrix is 15 to the cn. So gn is at most gn over two times 15 to the cn. And then immediately by induction, if uh, n is a power of two, then we certainly get that uh, gn is less than or equal to, uh, why don't I just uh, call that cn over two, so my c is, is, is different. All I've done is change the definition of the constant c, so that way I can say it's at most 15 to the cn, because I've got uh, by induction that's um, 15 to the cn over two. Uh, 15 to the cn over 2 yes times 15 to the cn over 2 which makes 15 to the cn uh, and since uh, gn is increasing in general without thinking about it too hard we can say gn is less than or equal to 15 to the 2 cn just by going up to the next multiple of the uh, next power of 2 And that's the end of the proof of the Stanley Wills conjecture as well. Um, as I say, this, um, although the proof doesn't really, I think, uh, introduce a method that's, I may be wrong about this, but as far as I know, it doesn't introduce a method that's of wide use for a lot of other problems. It's certainly true that these results are useful for a number of other problems. And it's definitely well worth um, being aware of them because it, it comes up quite a bit. And uh, who knows, maybe the sort of cleverness behind the uh, results may sort of rub off in some way and be, be useful. Good, thank you very much. I will stop at that point and see you next time.